This is Digital Perspectives with Brad Kimes. Subscribe for new content notifications. Now, here's Brad Kimes. Come on in. Welcome back to the show, everybody. You can follow me on Twitter at Backup Bradley Above and everything that we're talking about here today. So make sure you guys check out, sign that newsletter or join that newsletter, get on the rich list. And if you know anybody, because I do believe this space is about to pop wide open, if you know anybody or yourself needs a little more uh, rounding out of information or just try to get some quick information, I do have some educational crypto courses right here on this link. And you guys can turn those people on to that or you yourself might have some information you want to fill in the fragmentation of what you may or may not know it's a great starter course to round out your knowledge on this space going forward so make sure you check that out as well let's look at the numbers we got a lot to go over today i don't mind telling you we are going to go down into the executive order 13772 and i'm going to show you some information that I don't believe you've really seen to this great of detail before. You're going to want to know every single bit of it. And I'm also believe I'm going to show you why I believe this happens regardless of legislation, although legislation would be nice. Uh, but nevertheless, I believe I'm going to show you that today and why I can feel like I can be so optimistic going forward. Let's look at the numbers. Bitcoin, 11343 Ethereum, $373.62. XRP is $0.25 cents this morning, holding strong, 0 0.2556. The market cap is $11.5 billion plus. The 24-hour volume is $1.5 billion plus and we're up about a half a percent here and the total circulating supply is sitting at 45 billion 162 million those are your numbers let's get right into this thing right now so moving forward let's start with this there are some patent information filings that have been filed recently and thank you to the person who sent it to me i believe that person i have a couple that like to remain anonymous i believe that person is one of them. But thank you to the person that did that. I do appreciate all of you for the information you send. We watch for the Ripple IPO on the SEC page for you guys. Nothing to report on that front. However, there have been some new patent filings securing public key cryptographic algorithms. This is Nick Bogalis. You'll know him from the community. This was recently filed here in 2020 of June and let's see, and then we have another one here from Nick Bogalis, multiple asset transactions. And then we have private asset transactions also filed. And then back in May, we had obscure routing. Routing uh, was filed by Jimmy Fulton. And then another one from Michael Warnock on multi-hop path back in April. So just catching you up on that. We will keep an eye. You know, we covered the trademarks when they actually happened too back back a month ago or two, a couple months ago now. But nevertheless, we'll keep an eye on all of these things. Let's get to the information. So we start with this. We're going to run through that executive order. This may get a little lengthy, but I'm going to condense it as I'm going to move through this as quickly as I can. So stay with me here. So here we go. While CBDCs can certainly help to make international payments faster and cheaper, they cannot be seen as universal cure to cross-border frictions. Even bankers see that a CBDC will still need a universal bridge asset, and that's when XRP will come in. Shout out to XRP Crypto Wolf for that, because he's exactly right. And we know that because this is the World Economic Forum CBDC Policy Toolmaker Kit that shows clearly crypto assets designed for inter- and intrabank payments and settlement to work with the CBDC policy toolmaker kit that was given to every country leader, you know, uh, while they were at the World Economic Forum, of which Brad Garlinghouse was attending as well. You can see that XRP and JP Morgan coin are cited as a solution. The funny thing about that is, as a reminder, swell just a few days away here, Sheila Warren, the head of digital blockchain innovation at the World Economic Forum, wrote this document, and she's a keynote speaker at swell. 
Interesting little side fact right there. That's a fun fact. Here's another one. They had the uh, recent bill that went through the House of Representatives, the Digital Taxonomy Act, the Blockchain Innovation Act, were rolled into a third bill called the Com Consumer Safety Technology Act. That bill was approved by the House of Representatives on just a few days ago. We know that we saw that and covered that. The bill focuses on consumer protection, both in protecting the public against token scams and harnessing blockchain to stop fraud. Really great stuff in that. And it's really great that it got through the House of Representatives because that was the tougher sell. The fact that it's actually uh, sitting, I think it was the Agriculture Committee right now, I was just having a conversation with Mickey B. Fresh, um, which we will be doing a, soon, a show very soon. We just had our schedules get out of line a little bit. But we'll get back in line and we will have Mickey B. on the show. But regardless, I think it's in the Agriculture Committee once it gets through there and then out onto the Senate floor. I think it will probably get passed. I don't see why it wouldn't. At any rate... I believe, and I have said many times, that I think this gets done regardless of the lawmakers, and I would like to see the lawmakers participate in this process. Uh, we have heard Brad Garlinghouse and Chris Larson both pound the ground, make a call to action that we need this now. We've even heard Brian Brooks. Matter of fact, let's hear from Brian Brooks. Tell us that the U.S. is not leading right here. Right, The government is really, really good at establishing rules and conducting supervision. We're great at that. Government has no history at all of building products that innovate or that offer people good choices. And so why would we think that that would be different in constructing a payments instrument? I, I... And he's absolutely right right there. And I just want to add to that. He has absolutely said, we'll let the markets decide, the free market, the people decide, not government. Let's go. I just, I just don't think that's the right role. So we're trying to go out with frameworks. We're excited that there are tech companies coming out with tokens. Let's marry those two things up, our frameworks, their tokens. And then I think we can catch up to the rest of the world, which is way beyond us on this issue at the moment. So are you saying that other countries are ahead of the U.S. right now in terms of regulation? Well, I mean, look, China issued an e-remnant B that is now circulating, and they issued it last week. Our government says that we're four years away at a minimum from issuing a test version of a U.S. central bank digital currency. So I don't think that's a matter of opinion. You know, um, Even going further than that, the EU put out a draft stablecoin framework document about two weeks ago. We're working on that right now with our other agency partners, and I think we'll speak to that relatively shortly. But, um, but still, the EU is out in front of us. We are supposed to be the global financial leader, or at least we have been for the last 50 years. And I want to make sure that we retain status um, even as other countries are looking to catch up. That, that requires that we move faster. He makes a great point here, and I understand the point is completely valid as far as regulation goes. And what has been revealed and released to the public, Singapore and the UK and the EU, they're all further ahead in that regard. I personally believe that there's a lot more going on behind the scenes. And yes, I'm about to show it to you. And I'm absolutely going to show you also why I believe Brian Brooks is so confident and so sure about exactly where this needs to go, not only because of his experience in both the traditional banking world and the regulatory world and chief legal officer of Coinbase, because I think all those things are extremely pertinent too. But I'm going to get into why that is also, there's also another huge factor to this that cannot be denied. First of all, let's take a look at this. This is from the comments of the interview with Jay Clayton and Brian Brooks. This is a comment that was in response Brian Brooks had uh, to the moderator, and this is what he says here. It's important for me to recognize that this stuff sits inside the banking system, speaking about crypto and regulating crypto. Uh, and we need some rules around it. But at the end of the day, the thing that makes America strength and the reason that we are the most innovative country in the world is precisely because we let markets decide. I don't know if you know this, but the OCC does not need Congress's approval to make a decision about what digital assets are and what XRP even is. So let's go ahead and finish the thought here. To my point about the New York Stock Exchange companies going bankrupt, the New York Stock Exchange does not refuse to list a company because they think the product is crummy, right? They let the market decide if the product's good or not. They just have to set out a rules of, about disclosing what that thing is. Well, he just gave it to you. He just gave it to you. And that's where we're trying to do here, right? Or So at least I'm trying to do today is to let markets decide what they want 
and then we'll decide what's legal to maximize the ability of market actors to their market to, to make their decisions. And then Jay Clayton goes on to say, let me just say, I think we both let the market decide, but we both recognize that there are efficiencies that can be added to the market, but there are, we always are. That's the beauty of this, Jay Clayton says, and I'm sure I have no doubt one of the things that comes to mind in security interest, security interests are incredibly, incredibly paper intensive. Anytime there's a refinancing, the filing that have to go, you know, around the states and whatnot, and any leveraged finance lawyer on the phone knows this area where digitization could add tremendous amount of efficiency without a doubt. This is about regulatory coordination, right? And the reality is, is that it's about making sure that the entities, the regulators, all of them with their overlapping oversight are in complete coordination with one another and not in this siloed, I get to rule this and you don't. And, and if they have that coordination, we can move forward quite quickly without the legislation, but the legislation would be nice. Let me take you to this. This is the Executive Order 13772, Core Principles of Regulating the United States Financial System. We're about to dive into this in a way that I don't think I've ever seen anybody dive into it. So here's about what we're getting ready to do. Let's go ahead and do this. And look here. It does make it clear to review the Financial Stability Oversight Council, which I have told you how important that agency connected to the Treasury is as well as the Fed is. So let's go ahead and look at this. Shout out to Ripple Ricky, who posted this. There's a 2018 uh, follow-up to the executive order from 2017. Let's go ahead and begin to look at this. We will start on page 67, and I am skipping this entire document. is amazing, by the way. So let me just go a little further here and... Aligning the regulatory framework to promote innovation. Okay, that's where we start. Now, let's go ahead and move to 71. I'm skipping incredible information, okay? Modernizing regulatory frameworks for national activities. Let's keep going. And obviously, I am skipping through this to keep this as tight as possible. I will post this PDF for all of you to go through. Let's now move to page 153. Okay, one second, guys. Move through this here. And I'm telling you, every bit of this document is worth looking at here. Fintechs and payments, okay? Person to person. It deals with every single aspect that we talk about every single day. Digital wallets. It has everything in here, and you need to look at this. So let's keep going because Digital Wallets is in there. Let's go to 156 now where I want to show you payments modernization, and then it goes on to break into the Faster Payments Task Force. The task force consisted of over 300 stakeholders and was initially given a deadline of 2016. For completing this work, their final report was released in, two part, released in two parts in 2017. Part one discussed the task force's approach, and part two outlined the task force's recommendations, of which Ripple was certainly mentioned. Now, it does not say it in this document, and I wouldn't expect it to. However, the clearinghouse payment system, it dives down into all of that. We know Ryan Zagone was on the steering committee, the implementation of the findings of the McKinsey report, which is the second step of that faster payments task force. They joined the uh, task force in 2017. The task force was created in 2015. You know the drill, right? So you would literally have to believe at this point. You would literally have to believe at this point that if we don't get what we need, that Ripple's going to pick its headquarters up and move somewhere else, which, by the way, they have offices all over the world. Do you think for a moment that an executive order was written by the current administration and the Faster Payments Task Force was put together, has Ryan Zagone on it, the only person from the digital asset space that has a token representation from Ripple and XRP, 
and they've done all of this, and they're not going to use it? And then further going forward, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau actually puts out a rule effective citing two solutions for the first time in cross-border payments to allow transparency to be seen from the sender and receiver before accepting the payment and the path and seeing the path of payment. For the first time in history, they cite SWIFT and GPI and Ripple and the virtual currency XRP. And that rule was made effective July 21st, 2020. You would still have to believe that this isn't going to happen and then Ripple's going to move to headquarters. Look, I'm all for a call to action. I think it's right because there are hundreds of members in Congress that don't know the difference between Bitcoin and and Litecoin and XRP and Ethereum and the rest of it. What is blockchain? What is cryptocurrency? They don't know. And I understand that they don't know. Here's the beautiful part. Let's keep moving forward, okay? Because we looked at 156. Now let's go to 161, okay? Let's move through here to 161 really quickly here. Faster payments abroad. And then we come down into 161. And this shows the relationship around the world about cross-border payments, okay? It shows the relationship around the world, CHAPS, UK, ACH, how it all ties in. And it goes deeper into this through this article, by the way. Cross-border, faster payments. It says here, it talks about SWIFT and GPI solution because SWIFT has been around as a private member bank. I wouldn't expect them to announce Ripple or anything that they're doing in this executive order. However, it goes on to talk about the recommendations, right? Uh, Treasury highly recognizes the utility of the working group focused on continued high level, the U.S. payments to this end. Treasury looks forward to specific next steps, actionable deadline for continued work for the members of the Secure Payments Task Force and similar groups. The Federal Reserve should work as a convener, bringing people together, coordinator, driver of the product produced by members that work the Secure Payments Task Force. You know, this flies in the face of what Jerome Powell has been saying about a CBDC. Look, you can't have cross-border payments. I know they're talking about cross-border payments. Cross-border payments don't work with paper money. I mean, you can do that, but they need to make it digitized. That's what the executive order is about. It's about digitizing the entire financial system, which means a conversation about stable coins and CBDCs to get in those on and off ramps. Let's keep this moving, Okay. Uh, let's go to 170 right now. And like I said, I'm going to share this document with you. It is a great document. I'm going to put the PDF in the comment section for you. Okay, let's go here to 170, enabling the policy environment. And 170 here, I have this, regulatory sandboxes. This is what we really need. Because you don't want to have legislation too defined, and I don't think that I'm saying this about the current thing that's going through the House, the bill that's going through the House. I think that, look, if if Ripple and Chris Larson and those are behind those things and believe those things can be really good for us, I I feel that they, they know as well as anybody that they will be really good for us. However, what I want to show is is the idea and understanding that if the lawmakers don't give us what we need, the regulators can. The regulatory sandbox, competitive and free market, help foster economic growth. New ideas can facilitate uh, market efficiency, just as Jay Clayton talked about. Spurring environments to services and products. Not all innovations will succeed. Some might even cause harm. Regulation should address and potentially mitigate negative externalities. Uh, the regulatory environment with larger binary outcomes, either approval or disapproval, may lack appropriate flexibility for dealing with innovations and often results in extensive delays after which the innovation has become obsolete. The regulatory environment, and that look, that's what this is about, right? Either approval or disapproval may lack appropriate flexibility for dealing with the innovations and often result in extensive delays after which the innovation has become obsolete. That's why you have regulatory sandboxes. So you don't create legislation for something that is obsolete in six months. 
The regulatory environment should instead be flexible so that firms can experiment without the threat of enforcement action that would imperil uh, uh, the existing uh, existence of a firm. Innovating is an iterative process, and regulator feedback can play a helpful role while upholding safeguards and standards. It goes on to say here, and let me just look here. This is important stuff. Treasury recognizes the U.S. regulators already employ a number of methods in supporting innovative and encourage innovation, excuse me, and encourages them to build on their efforts. Some examples include outreach efforts conducted throughout the United States to meet with innovators, creation of agency innovation office of so that the innovators have certain or central point of contact, issuance of guidance, exemptive, exemptive orders, no action letters. What? I think that's what we've been getting, and I think we've been seeing, uh, Ripple has told us from day one, they meet with regulators more than anyone else in this industry or space, right? No action letters, which may have conditions or be time limited, but permit experimentation in the marketplace. Isn't that what the OCC and the SEC just did? Agency-wide working groups that span multiple divisions and offices to address new technology trends. Publication of white papers, speeches, and other materials discussing innovations in technology. Like I said, it's what Ripple's been doing from day one. In fact, they even put a headquarters in D.C. Engagement with foreign regulators on new developments, including cross-border collaborating agreements. Just like we've seen with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and SWIFT GPI and Ripple and and XRP being cited in cross-border payments for banks and credit unions for cross-border payments. I mean, what are we talking about here? During outreach discussions with the Treasury, however, many stakeholders expressed frustrated with the sheer number of agencies at the federal and state level that needs to be consulted when bringing new products or service to market. Now, this is a very real thing because Jay Clayton and Brian Brooks spoke to this. Okay? They spoke to this. They said that, you know, they have bilateral discussions and all of that with other regulators, and it seems to be going well by their standards. And I think think that's why they had the talk and that interview together. Um, uh, let's see. Or which units within those agencies not uh, need to be engaged or not. The, results, uh, the result is that innovators, particularly smaller firms, face significantly and are significant and unnecessary burdens in terms of time, money, and opportunity cost. Of course, the fragmented nature of the U.S. financial regulatory system undercuts the efforts by regulators to support innovation. Now, the fragmented, fragmented nature of the U.S. financial regulatory system, well, this is where you see Brian Brooks from the OCC telling you about a level playing field. He's telling you that when you see the payment sector and that there are companies out here worth hundreds of billions of dollars, that business used to reside within the banks 10 years ago, not outside of the banks. Well, now these non-bank entities like Venmo's and PayPal's and all these other apps that are out here as well as uh, money service businesses like uh, Ripple or or, or a vir- virtual asset service provider like exchanges, things of that nature, should all be under the umbrella of the banking industry because these are banking activities and modernized banking activities in Brian Brooks's eyes. And I see exactly what he sees. And I see that fragmented nature. And if you make the regulatory framework – So you can encompass all of these payment providers and virtual asset service providers and the like and put them all under the same uh, uh, regulatory framework as the banks already are. Now we have a level playing field. So, for example, a no action letter, again, which we've had several, right? A no action letter or an exemptive relief from one agency may be of limited use without a assurance that the other agencies with jurisdiction will provide comparable relief, which is why I believe you saw the OCC letters about custodying digital assets and holding reserves for stable coins for all federally chartered banks. Well, you know, that actually falls under PayPal and Venmo too, because if they're going to be under the same rules as a banking activity or as, as banks are, we're talking about a level playing field and then everybody's held to that same heightened prudential and that's the way it should be. Okay. 
So let's keep this going. Fragmentation also raises uh, the likelihood of inconsistency among regulators to be effective in a coordinated effort needed to be attained, appropriate relief across the marketplace, which is why, again, I believe you saw Jay Clayton and Brian Brooks working together, and they even referenced that it would be good to have a broad policy released by someone like FSOC when he was asked, a financial stability oversight council connected to the Treasury, just as you see housing finance policy. All right, let's keep this moving because we're almost there. Let's keep it moving. So we are at 171, right? All right, so let's go to 176 now, okay? And I'm skipping over so much amazing stuff. I've just read this thing over the last two and a half hours this morning. Okay, Treasury recommends that Congress enact legislation authorizing financial regulators to use other transaction authority for research and development and proof of concept technology projects. Regulators should use this authority to engage with the private sector to be better understand uh, new technologies and innovations and their implications for market participants and to carry out the regulatory responsibilities more effectively and efficiently using the expertise of a private sector in developing regulatory tools will generally produce more optimal solutions than restricting input to be entirely in-house. So the Treasury recommendation is that Congress enact some legislation here authorizing the regulators to use other transaction authority for the research and development, right? And then in this, they say, using the expertise of the private sector in developing regulatory tools. I think you just got the recommendation here from the Treasury that either Congress give it to you or, again, FSOC and Brian Brooks with the OCC can make decisions and can make rules and regulation that are very clear and allow this to happen. These two agencies do not need the approval from Congress to make this regulatory sandbox. And that is where I see the full court press. And it's really like a, a, a big squeeze, right? It really is like a big squeeze where, you know, you're either going to give what we need through legislation or we're going to make it happen through the bilateral uh, uh, efforts of, of the regulatory agencies and that that coordination through the regulatory agencies, rather, I should say. And we're going to create that regulatory sandbox. So one way or the other, we're getting it, baby. That's what's going down here. And that's the way that reads to me. Now, let's keep this going. There's one more stop here on the trail. And let's go down now to 190. Because this gets interesting because we've seen this before, but I wanted to pull this up so you could just see the enormity of it. And what we're looking at right here at 190 is the participants in the executive order engagement process. The participants in the executive order engagement process. And by the way, an executive order doesn't get voted on either. This is what's happening. This is what's happening. That's what executive order means. <laughs> it means I don't need anybody's approval. And here we see all the participants in the executive order engagement process. And it's all the proper agencies. Looky there. The Bureau of Consumer Financial Protection that already made a rule effective encompassing Ripple and XRP. This is the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network here, right? What do we see about them? Well, we know that FinCEN already told Ripple you were fine back in 2015 and you're free to go and do business, right? So we'll get all the other agencies where they need to be, right? Here's all the different non-United States entities that are in this. The Financial Conduct Authority, you know the drill, the IMF, which is recommended, you know, RippleNet be used and that FSOC actually could give it the systemically important financial market utility or infrastructure designation. Yeah, that needs to happen. So here we move forward, experts and advocates. I'm not going to go through them. What I am going to do is scroll down here to these company names and firms that participated on the private sector side. And there are many, 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 many firms. And we're looking here, American Express, okay? We know they're deeply involved with Am or Ripple. We know that Apple Pay is connected to Ripple. We know Google Pay is connected to Ripple. CLS Bank, you know what I mean? BNB Paribus. I'm not going to run through them all. They're massive. They're too massive to run through. And we know that 
Uh, let's see here. There's so many that are tied in. But what I'm going to do is just go to here, right? R3, Ripple. You see them right here. R3, Ripple. Participants in the engagement of the executive order from the current administration and president. That's what we're talking about here, right? All right. This isn't an invitation to a birthday party. This is an executive order. SoFi. Wow. That's interesting. SoFi was just on not long ago on the link to app. By the way, you guys should register for that. But um, okay. So at any rate, uh, you see this, right? I mean, you see th this is not a figment of your imagination. I repeat, at the end of the day, this is an executive order. I hope that the lawmakers get their self together, too, because there's always these short windows of time to be able to pass legislation. And I think we're coming up on one of those brief windows as well. And now that we've made it as far as through the House, who knows? Hopefully we get through the Senate and knowing that there's an executive order that all of this is to get done anyway. I think it does. So <laughs> I hope Congress will join us. I'll see you on the other side. Make sure you hit the like and subscribe, guys. Share with somebody you know. Don't forget, get on that monthly newsletter. I'm getting ready to put it out. Trust me, I know I was supposed to put it out last weekend. It's been a crazy week. A lot going on in me and Mrs. Backup's life, but it's all positive and, and very good. But I will say, I will get that out. I've promised to do it by Sunday, and we are going to make that happen. But hit the like and subscribe. Share with somebody you know. And if you know somebody needs some education, get on those courses. They are really affordable and well worth it. I will catch all of you on the next one.